The Immortal was one of the hardest ABGN episodes to make. Anyone on that set could attest to it. What made it exceptionally tough was that the whole video, once you get past the title, was all performed in one continuous long shot. In this first section, I'm actually playing the game for real, so it was important that the game booted up with every take. Anyone who's taken an NES cartridge out of the console and put it back in again knows how temperamental it is. I didn't want to risk the game not starting, so we had two Immortal cartridges. The first is the one in my hand, which you see me pretend to put in the console. You'll notice right there on the behind the scenes angle, I drop it in the box. The second cartridge was already in the console and playing on the demo screen, so when I was ready to play, all I had to do was hit reset and start. What you see here is the camera operator, Forrest, with this giant camera rig, I guess you can call it a big rig. Without the rig, Forrest would have to hold this heavy camera for hours, which would make his arm shake or fall right off, so the purpose of the rig was to balance the weight and keep the camera smooth. It goes on like a vest, has poles and cables, a million counterweights, it's like becoming a cyborg. Behind him is Tom, whose job is to operate a remote control that adjusts the camera's focus, aperture, and the direction it's pointing. We were originally using my top loader NES modded with AV output, which in recent years has been my only NES that still works. But luck would have it, my worst nightmare came true. It died right on the spot. That model NES has existed since the early 90s, and it decides to take a shit right here, right now in 2019, during a complicated project like this. Luckily, I had the ScreenWave guys bring theirs as a backup, which is an AVS model, and now I've bought one of my own. It must be stressed that I'm actually playing the game live while reviewing it, which is unlike any situation in any other nerd video. Sure, there were some situations, like in the Power Glove episode where I'm really playing, but the situation there was very different because I was ad-libbing and you mostly just see my arm. Here, I had a rehearsed set of things that was supposed to take place. The monster in the floor, the bait that kills you, the goblin, the bats, the invisible pit. It all had to happen in a set order for me to critique, and if I died in the wrong spot or missed something or took a longer path to get somewhere, I would just be babbling to fill dead air and losing my flow. I can't begin to tell you how difficult this was. In a typical nerd episode, whenever I'm reviewing the game, you're seeing playback footage and you're hearing me reading a script, and the game clips are edited to match what I'm saying. But this here is a rare exception where I'm actually playing what I'm saying while I'm saying it. The idea of the long take is probably the cinematic equivalent of pulling off a complicated skateboard move or something. The only reason to do it is because it's so challenging. Think of it like an unfair video game, where if you get hit once, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. If I mess up my lines, if a battery dies, or one of the many TVs and monitors didn't come on, we have to start all over again. You can see examples of the long take in Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, the opening shot of Touch of Evil, Russian Ark, Birdman, and a scene from the Coffin Joe classic, At Midnight I'll Take Your Soul, which probably had the most influence on me. This was a bucket list goal of mine. I've been wanting to do a long take for years, and Immortal seemed like a good fit. So how many takes did we do? Let's just say a lot, but there were nine complete takes where we made it all the way to the end. No take was perfect. The idea was to choose the best overall. Here's a sneaky little trick. When the camera goes to the back of the TV, I'm no longer trying to play it. I turn the controller upside down where I had the rest of my lines written on the back. Tricky, tricky. The set cost about $700, and with equipment rentals and everything else on top of it, I can only estimate at this time it may have been between $1,500 and three grand. Of a witch's tits fused with garlic and druid dump. Yeah, and th there's another goblin. Ah, so repetitive, you just mash those buttons. Kieran played the goblin. He's actually waiting the whole time in a bathroom. When I'd say the word dysentery, that was his cue to come out. Now imagine how funny it was to think of Kieran in a skin-tight goblin costume, waiting alone in a dark bathroom for somebody to say dysentery. For the battle, we wanted to mimic the stiff and awkward fighting style seen in the game. That's why our blows don't connect. Besides, Kieran couldn't see a thing anyway. The costume had no vision, especially in the dark. One take was ruined because I couldn't find where I last left the cane, so it was important that after every take, everything had to be reset to their original places, such as the key that I'm holding. To endure this vomitorium. 
Yeah, vomitorium, yeah, that, that's an interesting word. It means, or it was thought to have meant a place where the ancient Romans would all vomit during feasts to make room for more food. But that's just a misconception. It actually means a large Colosseum passage that large crowds can exit through rapidly, such as large crowds of vomit particles. Meanwhile, Justin is in the other room waiting for me to say a certain word so that he can start the monitor that's in the wall. That big camera rig could barely fit through the doorway. This set doubled as the Monster Madness set, which is why we put a little Easter egg in there. If you happen to notice, those corpses on the floor are wearing the same shirts that we wore in Monster Madness, implying that the two worlds are connected and something killed us off. The music was arranged by Anthony Lombardi, which was awesome because it was the first time I worked with him since 2004 with Legend of the Blue Hole. And one by one, the revelers all drop to their knees. Challenge is one thing, but in this game, every step can be deadly. Arrows, flames, giant worms, and there's bats that blend with the dark backgrounds. I mean, how can you avoid something which you cannot see? Trap doors are everywhere, which is a cheap shot, no question about it. I mean, can, can I walk here or will the floor swallow me? I mean, you'll never know. There's no strategy, no reward for skill. Thou must play it repeatedly to memorize where the pits are. These invisible pits are nothing but a cheap, mean-spirited beginner's trap meant to elicit false and ill-earned replay value. And also, if you touch anything, you die. Step on the wrong floor tile, you die. You, 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 you search the same spot more than once, you die. You approach a ladder or try to climb down a hole from the wrong side, you die. You stand still for too long, you die. You see some tiny little pixel that might be something you can pick up? Nay, it chances are it is but death. A There's a monitor mounted behind the fake stone that's playing back game footage that was previously recorded and edited by Kieran. This makes it the only nerd episode where the editing was done beforehand. I let him know all the parts from the game we needed to see on screen. The tricky part was having those parts match what I'm saying and sync up with the rhythm of my voice. For example, when I'd say amulet, we'd want to see the amulet. The monitor was hooked up to a computer in a hidden corner with Adobe Premiere so that in between takes, Kieran could edit the footage to readjust the timing, removing frames or making clips longer. Imagine him sitting in this awkward corner with a keyboard on his lap, leaning around a fake wall to see the monitor, and as he reported, in that corner was a big spider. You see Justin standing there? He's waiting to hear another cue word so he can hit play on the next monitor, the one on the floor. We had a little malfunction with the camera there, where it was pointing at the floor a little too long, but fortunately it didn't sabotage the whole take. We never wanted to combine the best parts of different takes. No matter what, my intention was to use just one take only, and that's what we did. Like the Apple II GS, the Amiga, the Atari ST, and Sega Genesis. And it's no surprise the Genesis version is better, but all of them had much cleaner graphics. I mean, they're bright and they look more crisp. And plus the other versions, especially the Genesis, had gore. It was important to me that, while this is a very different type of nerd episode, I made sure that you still see the game footage just as much as you would in a normal episode. The main difference is that I'm talking in front of it, rather than behind it. When I throw the severed hand on the screen, it flashed white. I thought that was a cool effect Kieran added, but he told me that was real. The screen actually flashed from getting hit by a rubber hand. The final screen is the one projected on the wall. It was playing off of a Sony Blu-ray player hidden in the first room that couldn't stay paused for more than five minutes or else it would shut off. So we just let it play, then Kieran had to grab the remote and skip back to the first chapter. And keep in mind, he was still in his goblin costume, and to find the remote, he had to quickly tear the mask off his face and his long hair would get stuck in it. He said at one point, he pulled out a chunk of hair. Ouch. The projector itself is hidden under the TV on the floor, if you can believe it. That was the only position that worked. For this section, I was going for something avant-garde. I wanted to be completely bathed in the game footage, as if the nerd was literally immersed in the game. But there were too many dark areas, so it didn't come off exactly as I hoped. After saying these lines so many times, take after take, I could recite them in my sleep, at least the opening part, which has become so automated in my brain, I actually caught myself saying them out loud in random situations. To get through all my lines, I couldn't rely on memory alone. I hid cue cards all around the room. You could probably tell I'm using them more toward the end. 
but it's still not easy because the room was dark and the only lights were blasting me in the eyes, making the cue cards hard to see. But even when I can see them well, I'd still sometimes fumble my lines. Try reading a book flawlessly without a single stutter or cough. It takes skill. That's why I have such respect for theater actors. And it's even harder when you don't have any other actors to play off. This is essentially one long monologue all to myself. I have a lav microphone hidden under my shirt. This way I was able to walk around and still get clear audio without anyone having to follow me around with a boom mic, which would have really gotten in the way. Controls, items that kill you, constantly dying and starting over. It only leaves you with frustration, anger, sadness, and crippling disappointment. Emotions that belong nowhere near video games. And when the manual is more fun to read than play the actual game, you know you're in trouble. I long for a time when I knew not what this game was. For the final section, Justin waited for one last cue so he could hit the lights on the green screen. We could have just left it on, but it would have thrown too much light on the rest of the set. Even though the video ends with the digital effects shot, I wanted it to still be part of the single take. So when I walk onto the green screen, it still never cuts. We couldn't get the angle I wanted. We saw a bunch of junk behind those fake rocks, so Kieran had to remove them by rotoscoping. If you're not sure what rotoscoping is, it's basically when you have to trace around an object and follow it frame by frame. Also, we couldn't get the camera as far away as I'd liked, so I had to stand closer to the green, which meant the green was reflecting on my shirt, so the shirt would get keyed off and look like it's disappearing. So Kieran had to digitally create a solid white layer underneath my shirt and animate it to follow. All this happening overnight before the episode was to release. Overall, this was a ton of work and we were all really proud of what we accomplished. This was something I always wanted to do and I'm glad we did it. Solid. Cool. Nice. All right. That's good stuff. Best one, you think? Yeah. yeah. That we think that was the best one? Yeah. I think well, that might, cool. might have been the best one. In my I day. feel like that was my best cool. one. Yeah. Nice. Not yeah. All right. All right. You think we can break down? I think so. Let me just okay. hang on a second. Checking labs and stuff. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I like how you screened at the end there because you knew it was like the last one for your voice. Yeah. All right, let's see. I'm going to oh, cut yeah, this. No, like, yep. Yeah.